Oh, hi there. You know, I figured it's about time we checked out a couple of these micro ATX systems. We've got one from HP, and one presumably custom-built system. Well, let's tear into these and see what's going on in there. Of course I'm going to start with this one. Who could say no to that face? Just look at them cheeks. Got a 52-speed CD-ROM drive here, and that is only a CD-ROM drive. No burning, no DVD playback. CD only. And we got a faceplate molded floppy drive slot for extra character. And that is actually a full face floppy drive back there. So fortunately nothing special about it. And I just have to show you a side shot of this thing. Looking at it straight on doesn't do much justice for the curvature of it. That thing is quite swoopy. And I just now noticed, it looks like this is a door that covers that drive bay. Yeah, it sure is. How about that? And this is one of those removable hard drive caddies. Let's see if it's locked. Nope, not locked. But also doesn't contain a drive. And there's no sign of the key anywhere. And these things allow you to make standard internal 3.5 inch drives easily removable. You just install your regular IDE hard drive in this caddy, and you're good to go. And even though this looks for all the world like a SCSI connector, in this case it is in fact carrying IDE. It's also carrying power. Let's go ahead and slide this thing open. Easier said than done. And that's all there is to it. Too bad we don't have a drive in there to explore. Let's hope there's an internal hard drive. Let's just get that back in there for now. You know, it's kind of a miracle that this door never broke off. And here's a look at the back of the machine. That's a pretty well-equipped motherboard. We've got almost everything on board, including USB, video, and sound. We also have a NIC and a dial-up modem down here. Gotta be able to reach those interwebs. And I guess this tower is just too small for a full-size ATX power supply. This is actually an SFX power supply. The same pinout and everything as an ATX power supply, but just a smaller case. And what a remarkable piece of history we've uncovered here. This is the first computer. Unbelievable. Who knew the first computer ran Windows 98? Somebody better contact the historians. And the sides of the faceplate have these air intakes here for that extra sporty look. That's plus five horsepower right there. All right, let's get this thing open. That's if it'll let me. I tell nobody's been in here for a good long while. Well, that was an effort. And no internal hard drive. Oh well. And check this out. This motherboard can accept either a slot 1 or a PGA CPU. Now that is something I've never seen before in person. Now, that's got to be a Pentium 3 or Celeron. I can't imagine it's anything else. Let's go ahead and clear these cables out. Okay, apparently we have to remove the rest of the case metal in order to get to the drives up here. That's interesting. And it looks like removing just a couple more screws gets that done. Oh, it's got some flight in it. Yeah, there we go. There, now we have some access. Although, the Molex connector on that drive caddy looks like it's going to be fun. Yeah, removing that Molex connector simply ain't happening. I'm gonna have to take the drive loose and shove it forward. Okay, I've got that loosened up now. Still not the easiest thing in the world. There we go. Oh, that sucked. Might as well pull it the rest of the way. And I might as well pull this power supply and get these cables out of my way. Space is definitely a premium in this case. And finally, we can see the motherboard. And yeah, this board most certainly will take either a slot 1 or a PGA370 CPU. Though I highly, highly doubt you can run both at the same time. But that's an interesting little artifact from the transition period, going from slot 1 to PGA. And apparently it has a few more tricks up its sleeve. That NIC is actually integrated. Looks like that board is mostly passive components. Let's check it out. And yeah, no brains on this board. All passive components. See, we just have the little magnetics pack there. So the Ethernet controller is definitely on the motherboard. Let's see if the same is true for that modem. 
Well, it's hard to say. It looks like most of the brains might be on the motherboard. This thing certainly attaches in an interesting way. It looks like this board is mostly the analog side. There certainly were a lot of interesting choices made in the design of this motherboard. Now, the brackets of this CPU actually fold down, so let's go ahead and do that to reduce the chances of breaking them. Now, let's see what we have in the PGA socket. And that's looking like a Celeron. And whoever put this thing together did not believe in thermal grease. Like, at all. That is awful. Let's go ahead and pull that chip out of there. And it is indeed a Celeron, with my most favorite thing in the world, a warranty sticker in contact with CPU pins. That just annoys me to no end. Well, let's get this thing cleaned up. Let's soften that up with some IPA. There we go, now we can finally see what we're working with. That's a 500 megahertz Intel Celeron. Based on that stepping, it's probably from around 1999 or so. And the ghost of thermal paste passed cleaned up relatively easily. Good enough for me. All right, let's give that fan a whirl and see how it's sounding. It sounds a little grindy, but not bad enough for me to oil it though. I'm just gonna clean it up. Good enough. Now I just have to clean up the rest of this thing. But you know what? That motherboard tray looks removable. So you know I have to investigate that. Let's disconnect that front panel. And I see two screws here. Let's get rid of those. Now, do we slide? Yes, we do, easily. Love, love, love. This seems to be a rare feature on ATX cases, but always appreciated. Okay, let's check that RAM, why not? Got a 64 meg stick of PC100 there. The chip's branded M-Tech, so I almost infringed on their trademark. More ridiculous warranty stickers. And that's the same one that was on the CPU. I guess whoever built this system felt like they were pretty important. Now, let's get that CPU back in there. That'll help to minimize the amount of dust that goes in that socket. Sure makes a dreadful sound. Now, let's clean this thing up. Let's see, how's that battery? Dead? Yep, it's dead. Okay, let's get that CPU dressed. Okay, let's get these drives out. And look at that, we have a removable drive cage. This case is all smiles. Okay, I spoke too soon. Something else is holding that in. And I don't see any other screws. Ah, there's a metal tang you have to bend up out of the way. Well, that's just mildly annoying. And that is one crazy generic CD-ROM drive, manufactured by Top Glory Electronics. I just love it when my CD drives come with hyperbole. No manufacture date, though. Let's wipe it off. Let's see if it's glorious enough to open. Not sounding good. Yep, not glorious enough. Let's see if it'll open up with help. Yeah, it sure does. Maybe it's just that sticky gasket. Let's see. Nope, that is definitely a bad belt. I wonder if this thing's even worth servicing. Will you go back in there at all? Well, let's open it up and at least try. Okay, well, considering both of the drive tray release clips broke off from just the slightest bit of bending because they're made out of the cheapest plastic in the history of the universe, I think the glory ends here. Yeah, I'm not spending any more time on this thing because now the disc tray won't stay in the drive. But here you can see what happens to these old belts. When they stay in one position for too long, they take on the shape of the pulleys. See, we have this little hump here. And that takes way too much torque for that little bitty motor to overcome. Sometimes you can get away with boiling them to return them to their original shape, but if you can replace them, you should. Okay, let's test this floaty bit. Eh, 
And no explosions. Boring. The sacrificial hard drive lives to fight another day. Okay, that's five minutes. No such death. And that is just sinister. I'm trying to reconnect the faceplate, but there's no indication on the silk screening what any of those headers do, leaving you completely dependent on the manual. I guess true evil does exist. Good thing I have video. What the hell are you smiling at? Okay, time to find out what, if anything, it does. I've got that junky CD-ROM back in there, because who would I be if I didn't still try to test it? For science, you know. Let's DOS it up. Power on. And we are not posting. We should have gotten a floppy seek by now. What's your problem? Let's find out. Okay, suspect number one, RAM. I'm just gonna go over that edge connector and see what that gets us. Okay, that edge connector is spotless now. Let's see if that does it. And yep, sure does. We are posting. Something's making a strange sound in there. What's that thing ticking about? And it didn't boot from floppy. And that's interesting, this machine can network boot. Okay, let's see what's going on with that floppy drive. Oh gee, wonder why it's not working. Okay, so we confirmed it's not a Bluetooth floppy drive. And we did boot successfully and loaded the CD driver. But what are the chances I can get it to actually open? That might be tough. Yeah, it wants nothing to do with it. How about we just... Aha! Uh -huh. It actually still stopped itself. Though just barely. The thing does want to come out. Oops. <laughs> no. You can't have it. Give it up. Oh, that thing's mad now. Quit. It's trying to push the tray out. And wants to do nothing else. Okay, after way too much fighting, I managed to get it back in there. But now, it does want to come all the way out. And I gotta kinda hold it. And then it just wants to go back in. So this is gonna require some trickery. Real quick. Come on, take it. Yeah. And <laughs> miraculously, it does spin up. Let's see if it works. And <laughs> of course it does. That's one of those ultra noisy high speed drives too. It's too bad about that disc tray. And just to prove it's not me, look how insanely brittle this thing is. That was barely any pressure at all. I don't think I've ever seen such brittle plastic. I guess they put all the money into the laser lens. Okay, apart from being a little scuffy, I don't see many problems with this faceplate, so let's get it cleaned up. Looks like it collided with a smurf up here. And whatever that is, it's not coming off easily. We're gonna have to hit that with something harder. And that's as far as Windex is taking us. Let's try alcohol. And that takes it right off. I guess IPA can dissolve a Smurf. And the alcohol's not doing much for these scuffs. Let's try the magic eraser. And that does it. There, now it has even more to smile about. Yeah, this case has definitely grown on me. Despite the tight working conditions inside, that removable motherboard tray is the key to my heart. And who could say no to that face? And that slot one slash PGA motherboard is definitely a fascinating relic of a world in between CPU standards. This system has a lot more smiles to give. Let's move on to the next system. Next system is the HP Brio. Is it Brio or Brio? I don't know. But we have a slot loading CD drive there. So no dealing with those pesky drive tray belts. Although that drive probably has its own unique set of challenges. And we're from the Windows 98 era, sporting a Pentium 3. And that floppy drive looks like it could be unique. It certainly has an unusual button and door. Hopefully it's a common model that HP just dressed up. And we've got a Windows 98 COA sticker there, as well as HP's model number sticker. And I see that HP was doing that product number thing even back then. Anyone who's ever dealt with HP in an enterprise environment knows how annoying that is. Because it's not enough to just look up the serial number. No sir, that's not unique enough according to HP. I swear I'm not bitter. And here's a look at the back of the machine. I see we have a mid-tower mounted SFX power supply there. 
Got a motherboard with all the fixins, everything on board except the NIC, and of course a dial-up modem. And here's a goodly look at that sticker. All right, let's get this thing open. This machine has these ultra convenient thumb screws that are positively retained. See, they stay with the case. That's very thoughtful of them. And I gotta say, it is awfully strange to see an ATX system that doesn't use those side panels. This is like the old school AT cases with the full metal surrounding. Let's get that off. No fuss. And hey, I see we have a hard drive in there. And we have a manufacture date, January 23rd, 2000. Okay, first things first, let's get this power supply out of our way. Because it's really in our way. And I might as well get rid of these cables too. And we've got a slot one Pentium 3, and this whole system is cooled only by the power supply fan. And that's the only fan in this entire system. No pressure. And this crossbar here is not removable, unless you like drilling rivets, which I don't. So we're gonna have to work around that. Let's get that CD audio cable out of the way. Now let's pull that CPU out of there and hope those clips don't break. Well, against all odds, no clip breakage. And that's a 550 megahertz CPU, 512K a cache, and 100 megahertz frontside bus, stepping SL3 F7. Pretty. And being fanless, remarkably clean. Let's put that to the side for now. And this system must have gotten whacked at some point. That dial up modem has been harassed out of its PCI slot. Must have taken quite a hit to do that. I'm surprised I don't see any damage on the case. Let's go ahead and check those cards out. HP sure love their Torx screws. T15's everywhere. And I got a 3Com nick there. Fast Etherlink. With a MAC address that has the word DAD in it. That's gotta be unique. 10100 of course. And this whole system is reasonably clean. There's just the slightest hint of dust. I've definitely seen a lot worse. Now let's check that modem. It's already mostly out. A smart link. Can't say I'm familiar with that. I like how they opted to make their own rectifier with diodes there, rather than use a single package rectifiers. Wonder how many pennies that saved. Yep, as basic as they come. And the onboard graphics is provided by Matrox, MGA G200A D2, and the sound is provided by Crystal, CS4280-CM. And got to admire the presence of an ISA slot, so you can pop that old sound blaster right in there. And that RAM stick is being blocked by the floppy drive. Let's get that out of the way. Looks like we have just a single torque screw holding that drive cage in. Now, do we slide? Yep, we slide. Well, that was pretty easy. Now that it's unencumbered, let's check out that RAM. That is an HP original stick. 128 megs of PC100. Manufactured by NEC in Ireland. Clean enough. And I'm guessing that hard drive cage is held in with a similar contrivance. I just see this single screw here. Now, how goes it? Yeah, it goes down apparently. And apparently CD drive removal requires faceplate removal. See, it interferes. And I thought I could slide it back and remove it through the top, but it's catching on something. And I don't want to break anything, so let's get that faceplate off. First, let's get that faceplate disconnected. Luckily, it's just one single header. Now, removal seems simple enough. I just see four clips manipulated in the right order. Should be able to get this thing off, hopefully in one piece. Right after that cable gets done catching on absolutely everything. Simple as that. There, that's a little easier. And this system also has a removable motherboard tray. I suppose it would have to with that crossbar in the way. Well, don't mind if I do.
Simple as that. And I thought that capacitor looked a little funny. Turns out it's more than funny. It's plaguey. And leaky. So that thing has to come off. The problem is I don't have a replacement for it. Every time I order some of these, I'm always missing that one weird value. Luckily, these capacitors are all in parallel, so there's a chance we'll still be able to test this thing while being short one, because I definitely don't have time to wait for a parts order. Let's get that thing off of there. Let's get some flux on there. Now, this is usually easy peasy with the desoldering alloy. Usually these things just fall off the board. Yep, there it goes. Now let's wick up our mess. Scrub, scrub. Clean as can be. And that thing didn't just leak. It had a blowout. It's kind of really hard to get on camera, but that rubber plug is shoved off to the side. Yeah, they don't always vent through the top. Now I gotta clean up this bloody mess, and then I'll have to go over the backside again. Fortunately, this electrolyte doesn't seem to be particularly corrosive. That could have been very bad so close to that CPU slot. Yep, not a hint of corrosion anywhere. Now, how about that battery? Is it all the way dead? Yep, dead enough for me. Oh, these clips. I remember these clips. I also remember that they're pretty much impossible to remove without breaking them. So I was gonna refresh the thermal paste, but now we're just gonna have to hope. I got faith in you, little buddy. Well, let's move on to the drives then. There's that CD drive made by Hitachi, manufactured October 1997. It feels like a really robust drive, just based on weight. And it has a compact part number. I'm pretty sure this machine was built before the HP Compact acquisition, or maybe they started sharing parts prior to that. Or more likely, this was just pulled from a compact. And here's the hard drive, a 13.5 gig Seagate Barracuda, clearly an HP original. I'm not quite sure how to interpret that date code. I'm going to assume that means the 42nd week of the year 2000. So I guess that date on the side of the case probably just was the manufacture date of the case, with the system being assembled later. There's an interesting bit of whatnot on the underside of this drive. They call it the C-Shield, for your drive's protection. And here's that floppy drive, made by Alps. And I'm taking that code to mean the 27th week in 1999. I don't know if that's what it actually means, but I'm taking it. I'm not super familiar with these drives, but I see a screw back here. Now, this seems slidey. No, I guess not. Aha, there we go. It's got a couple of hidden hooks. Man, that thing is really clean inside. Even that grease looks fine. It still needs a refresh, though. Heads are super clean. I don't often see dark grease on a floppy drive. Seems pretty high quality. But new grease is better. Can't forget the lead screw. And that's a tiny power supply. Let's see if we can make a big boom. So the minus 12 volt rail is kind of low, but it also doesn't have any load on it, so I guess I can forgive that. Switch mode power supplies are really dependent on feedback. And I'm just gonna let those click away for five minutes. And that is it. Another fully functional SFX power supply. All right, got everything back together. Let's get this thing tested. Okay, those are happy sounds, and we're posting. Ooh, hardware diagnostics. Now yeah, we got Windows 98 on it. Ooh, that hard drive sounds lovely. Yeah, that thing's deliciously crunchy. Those are some of my favorite sounds in the world. And we've got a password on there, but we don't care. This is Win9X. We don't need any passwords. We just hit cancel. Oh no, not plug and pray. Oh, it's just for the monitor. Or the fake monitor from the capture device. Go ahead, do your thing. The 
the sound of that clunky hard drive with that Windows 98 startup sound, there's just nothing better. And this must be the original HP image. That looks like a Brio B in the background. And yeah, there's a Hewlett Packard utility right there. Smart disk monitoring tool. And we got the taskbar on the top. Someone was thinking different. Yeah, I don't think we're getting our dial-up connection. I'm not sure if Bell South even still exists. Let's get rid of that. Ew, what's this? Ritz picks with a free upgrade. How could I resist that? Well, it turns out I can. Remind me next time. Problem with registration? Oh no. Okay, go away. Now, let's see what we have on this thing. See, we have an Excel document from 2006 down there. That seems pretty late in the game for this system. That's already quite a long life for this era of computing. Let's see what else we have. Hmm, not a whole lot. Looks like this thing might have been just a home office slash internet PC. What is the Brio agent? Uh, apparently it's not installed. How about Hewlett Packard? Got a bunch of printer and software update stuff. Classic HP. Hmm, DVD Express. This thing doesn't have a DVD drive. At least I'm pretty sure that's not a DVD drive. Perhaps this machine was originally spec'd with one. That would have been quite fancy in the year 2000. <laughs> I gotta see this ancient version of Outlook. Outlook 97. And Clippy! The original Clippy! Oh no, can't read my email profile. And now we see the origins of the corrupted PST and OST files. I guess it was a thing even back then. All you Windows admins know what I'm talking about. Okay, let's get out of here. Clippy, you've been no help at all. What else do we have? Let's see, what's big idea? What's the big idea? Minnesota kook? Is that how you pronounce that? What in the devil is this? It's gotta be some kind of game. Well, let's see. <laughs> Why we do what we do. And yeah, this is looking gamey. See, so can we skip this? Oh, Lord. It's time for your Minnesota Cuke Adventure. Type in your name, or choose your name from the list if you've been here before. All right, we're going on an adventure. Well, let's click on my name and get started. Hmm, you know what? We're going to be Tom for right now. It's time for your Minnesota Cuke Adventure. Type in your name, or okay. choose your name from the list if you've been here before. Click on the what? I guess go. Fancy croc? What does that mean? Okay, let's go. Uh, I'm not sure if I should get into this. But you know what? Let's see. Let's hit the any key. Uh, it just crashed. <laughs> I guess our adventure ends there. Alright, well, that's all we're seeing of that game. Alright, what else? Eh, not much else. What is Trellix? Okay, you've got my curiosity. Trellix Web HP Brio Edition. Publishing a website is a snap. Oh, this must be some kind of WYSIWYG editor or something. Okay. Start building your website with the help from a tutorial that leads you through the process. Alright, now I can finally get that website built. You know what, let's go through it. I will humor you. Oh man, that is one 90s chic website. All right, I'm ready to start. Ooh, this looks kind of complicated. Let's see, I bet we can jump in. Oh, <laughs> that is cool. But I wonder if it lets you see the actual HTML as generating. Well, it doesn't look like it. Unless it's hidden somewhere. Let's try right-clicking. No, I guess not. This is strictly WYSIWYG, or what you see is what you get. Well, that's cool. Let's get out of here. No, I would not like to save. Well, let's see what's on the root of that drive. Oh, that hard drive sounds beautiful. Let's see, what's our free space situation? What the? Explorer crashed? I wonder if there's some file system corruption here. Okay. Let's try that again. 
Interesting. Crashes every time I hit properties on C drive. Okay. Oh, now we're in active desktop recovery. Maybe that was the issue. Let's try again. Nope. Oh well. Go ahead and crash. Okay, well let's explore that drive, if we can. Yeah, we sure can. Not a whole lot on here. Let's see what's that scan disk log date. March 2006. Let's try to get an idea of when the last time this thing was used. Let's see what documents we have. Nothing. Not even any pictures? Our pictures. Sounds generic. Hmm. We've got folders by year. Let's see what's in 97. Nothing, apparently. 2005. There's the pictures folder. We've got scans. And it's probably nothing I can show on video. Well, let's see. Okay, it's just some human people looking very 2005-ish. And that's probably what the rest of these are. Oh, now we have previews. Interesting. Takes a while to generate, though. There's yet more human people. Yet another. And yet more. Okay, nothing groundbreaking there. How about 2006? And it's empty. All right, at least I won't have to do any blurring. So I'm gonna guess this thing was used up to 2006. I really need a more accurate way to date Win9x. I have yet to find a really concrete last used date in the logs for Windows 95 and Windows 98. So if you know of one, please let me know. It's easy enough on Windows NT. Okay, how about the rest of these drives? Let's see what the floppy drive has to say. And it says, I work fine. Actually, it sounds really good. A noisy hard drive and a noisy floppy drive? I think I'm in love. But the big question is, does that CD-ROM drive work? Let's see. Um, okay, there it goes. Sure took it a while to take that disc. Sounds like it's doing it. Yep, sure is. And it's making some interesting sounds too, though not altogether bad sounds. I'm gonna go ahead and try to copy some data off of it so I can get the full experience. Okay, we're not installing AOL today. Exit setup. Boy, they sure try to keep you. Keep exiting. There we go. All right, let's explore that disk. Let's just copy the whole AOL tech directory to C drive. Okay, well, it's actually kind of quiet, but it was sure making some juddering sounds, like the laser lens assembly was moving with extreme confidence. But do we get our disk back? Yes, we do. But there's one thing I always wondered about these slot loading CD drives. How well do they work with three inch CDs? Let's find out. Hey, it took it. And yeah, it's doing it. All right, so that works. Judging by how far I had to push that full size CD in, I thought it wouldn't. All right, good job, drive. <laughs> that little thing looks so funny in there. Okay, let's drop down the DOS code and check out that hard drive. Okay, first of all, let's do check disk and see what our usage is. 11.2 gigabytes free. So yeah, there wasn't very much on this thing at all. Let's run scan disk on it. Scan disk. All right, the file system's clean. Yeah, that drive is just barely used. And this scan's gonna take a while. I think that's it. Yep, healthy drive. Okay, all that's left to do is give this thing a little cleaning. And that's really all it needs is a little. This faceplate's pretty clean as it is. Yep, like night and day. It does have some paint problems on the outside of the case though. We've got some scrapes here and there, a little bit of surface rust here, 
various missing paint chips. Oh well, what are you gonna do? The thing is old enough to drink, you know. Well, one bad capacitor couldn't keep this thing down. This machine definitely inherited all that 90s HP quality. Not a single functional issue. High quality parts, high quality outcome. I sure wish I could heap such praise on my modern HP laptop. That thing's junk. Built like a tank it is. As robust as they come. Just like the generosity of the fine people on Patreon. I appreciate everyone's patience while the beginning of this year had some pretty interesting challenges. Your steadfast support is highly appreciated. But, I'm back at it now. See you in the next one.